Hey man, this is really going to be a special morning. I'm going to tell a story as Rodney goes to get Tanya, but um, when this church, the first day that this building, that we opened this building, was the first day that Rodney and Tanya came to this church. They had just moved in the area. They didn't know it was our first day of having this building, but they came in and, uh, and they jumped in right away. In fact, Rodney and Tanya were our first youth helpers, youth workers, as we, um, when we started in this building. And, uh, and they have been a blessing for however many years that's been, 17 years, I think. And, uh, and if you didn't know Tanya before, Tanya was one of the most athletic women that I'd ever seen. And, uh, and I was able to, I turned all our games over to her because she was so much better at it than I was. <laughs> and, uh, and Rodney did all our music for you. And so they are uh, just super friends of Nita and mine, and I know to many of you, but, um, but they've been a blessing to us. They still have the chill, they still have the youth go to their house and they have to take them out on the boats and, uh, and do all kinds of stuff with them. They're just awesome people. And uh, we've been going through this Who's Your One, and Tanya came to me and said, um, the, I've been talking about sharing our story, and uh, she said, God's just been really hammering her about sharing her story. So this morning, uh, Tanya's going to come, and she is going to share her story, and I know it's going to bless your heart. So let's pray as she comes over. Father, we love you. God, I thank you, God, that you love us, Lord, and in spite of the storms, in spite of all the things that, that go on in our lives, Lord, you're still in control. So this morning, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll be with Tanya as she shares her testimony and her story of what you've done in her life. I just pray, God, that you'll just speak to our hearts. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, as Pastor Chris said, my name is Tanya. God bless you. Picture to say, most of you probably know me, or at least know of me. Um, if you're an old time Southern Laker, like Chris said, you probably know me and know more about me. If some of you know me as Rodney's wife, the dancing ukulele player, <laughs> his wife. And some of you just know me as the welfare lady, but that's fine. Um, today I want to tell you a little bit more about me, about my story, and what God's done for me, and what he continues to do for me. Um, why am I here? That's a really good question. Um, several weeks ago, God started telling me that I needed to share my testimony with you, my story. Say, what, God? I don't think so. I'm perfectly happy being invisible. I'm not a public speaker. I kind of felt like Jonah at this point. I don't think so. <laughs> but God just kept on. He kept on hammering me. In my quiet times, verses would come up like, it is God himself who has made us what we are and has given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives helping others. And then he would share more thoughts with me on things like, God calls you to do a service far beyond anything you could ever imagine. You were put on earth to make a difference and a contribution. You weren't put here just to consume resources, to eat, to breathe, to take up space. You were created to add life on earth, and God wants you to give something back. Okay, God, I hear you. I get your point. So I finally got up the nerve to tell Rodney what was going on, and we talked about it. After we talked about it for a while, we came to Pastor Chris and talked to Pastor Chris. And Chris said, yeah, I think you're great there. So here I am. Now, I will ask that you bear with me, because I am not a public speaker, and I am nervous, and this is hard for me, both physically and mentally, so please bear with me. But I guess I'll start my story by that, telling you when I became a Christian. See, I come from a long line of Christians. My I was definitely raised in a Christian home. Actually, my great-grandfather was one of the founding members of the church that I grew up in. To say that I was surrounded by Christian influences would be an understatement. My parents, my grandparents, teachers, preachers, community members, coaches, family friends, everyone made a huge difference in my life. But I would have to say, Two of the biggest spiritual giants in my life would have to be my grandmothers. I was actually lucky enough to be raised right across the road from right across the driveway from one of these ladies. You can 
spent that I spent a lot of time on her house and under her feet. One day when I was out of her house, it happened to be revival week at church. We were both in her bathroom for whatever reason. Maybe she was cleaning out her closet or fixing her hair. But she turned to me and asked, are you a Christian? Grandma, I'm at the church every time the doors are open. <laughs> no, are you a Christian? Have you ever accepted Christ in your heart? I knew what she meant. I knew that I was a sinner. I wasn't perfect. And I knew that Christ had died for me. So right then, that day, in her bathroom, I accepted Christ. Now, that wouldn't mean that all the spiritual giants in my life would stop teaching me and guiding me and directing me and preparing me for the future. I think one of the biggest lessons that I took from my life growing up would have to be that I am a child of God and I am blessed. If I had to share my life verse with you right here, it would have to be 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say rejoice sometimes. It doesn't say rejoice whenever you feel like it. It doesn't say, it says give thanks for all things in all circumstances. I remember growing up and constantly hearing, you're a child of God. You are blessed. Sometimes the good is hard to see in things, but it's always there. I would have to say one of my favorite sermons that really stuck with me that I heard growing up. Our preacher talked about how sometimes we have to become like that little child. You've all heard little kids give their bedtime prayers sometimes. It goes something like this. Dear God, thank you for mommy and daddy and the flowers and the trees and my pink blanket and the bunny rabbits. You kind of get the idea. But he said sometimes we have to go back and I took that little child and be thankful for the small things in life in order to understand and be more, be more appreciative of the big things. So I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I had growing up. I want you to take that and stick that in your pocket because we're going to need that a little bit later. The next thing that I want you to know about me would have to be water. Now, I love water. I love water so much that at one point in time, one of my nieces told me, Aunt Tanya, you need to be a fish. <laughs> so I laughed at her, but she might have been right. And, um, I'm going to stop right here and blame it on my parents, which are here, by the way. Um, my mom didn't learn to swim until she was an older teenager. My dad loved water and water activity. So when we were born, both my brother and I, they threw us in the deep end at the pool at two months old and told us to get out. <laughs> uh, that's only a slight exaggeration. Oops, I'm running over things. All right. Um, but I'm actually really grateful that they did that because water has actually kind of directed a lot of things in my life. It's directed places that I've gone, people that I've met, where I live now, my husband loves water, so it's actually also helped guide my spiritual life. Now, whenever I was a teenager, my family took up water skiing, and with my love of water, I immediately became infatuated with it. So today, I'm going to give you a little bonus lesson. I want to teach you about water skiing. Play the video, please. Got a short video clip here for you to watch.
tournament water ski slalom. What is it? The objective of this sport is simple. Accumulate the most buoys with the least amount of men. The boat is set at an average speed of 55 kilometers per hour for women, 58 kilometers per hour for men. These are maintained with a GPS-based speed control system. Each pass starts and ends with the gates, a pair of buoys that must be accurately passed through. A miss on either end stops the scoring. Once past the entry gate, the skier rounds a series of six turn buoys, three on each side of the course. Rounding these and passing through the exit gates completes a pass. After each complete pass, the rope is shortened to the next predetermined line length. With the width of the course remaining the same, the shortened rope increases the difficulty in making it around the turn buoys. Consider this, the course width is 11 and a half meters wide. There are several line lengths that are 11 and a quarter meters and shorter. You do the math. A full buoy count is given for each successful turn and return to the weights. Fractions of buoys are also given, provided the skier makes it at least outside of the buoy width. A fall or a miss ends the run. The most buoys on the shortest line wins. High speeds, breathtaking turns, cat-like reflexes, and incredible athleticism. Everything encapsulated into one incredible sporting spectacle. Tournament Water Ski Slalom. Now that's what it is. All right. I can promise you I didn't look like that. <laughs> uh, then why would I waste your time to teach you about water skiing? Oh, we don't want to teach it again, sorry. All right. Why would I waste your time to teach you about water skiing? See, there is a legend in water skiing by the name of Christy Everton Johnson. I got to hear Christy's testimony one time. And while her testimony is not mine, she used an analogy that I really liked. And I've, it stuck with me. I've used it in my life to help guide my life and keep perspective. The first thing is that the boat and driver represent God. As a skier, the boat gives you power to get out of the water. It's what directs the course that you take. It's actually responsible for your safety. And if you have a good boat and driver, whenever they turn around, they're going to coach you and they're going to encourage you. And that's exactly what God is in the Christian's life. God is our power. He directs us. He, we follow him. We take his path. He is always there to protect us. And he is a massively great coach. Best coach we can ever be. The next thing in the analogy, oh, sorry, this one here. One other thing that you need to know. And skiers don't like rough water. We'd rather ski with it nice and sliss and smooth. But if you get in rough water, the safest place to get is actually behind the boat. It helps break up that rough water. Guess what God tells us in Isaiah 43 too, He says, when you go through the water, I will be with you. And through the rivers, rivers are rough water. They will not go over you. And when you go through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will have no power over you. God tells us right there in the Bible that he's going to get us through those rough waters. The next thing in the analogy is the skier. The skier is the Christian. Now, whenever you get up behind the boat water skiing, you call being in the boat's wake. But the goal for a skier is not to stay behind the boat. It's to get outside of the wake and go side to side. That's exactly what God wants us to do. He says, don't stay in my wake. Go outside reach other people, bring people back to me. Now, there's another job of the skier, and that's to hold on to the rope. The rope is the connection between the skier and the boat. The rope is the connection between the person and God. One of my favorite memories of teaching someone to water ski is a young lady that every single time we got her up, she screamed and threw the rope down. <laughs> now, as it's happened over and over, 
until we almost threatened to duct tape our hands to the rope. But as a, as a Christian, if we don't hold on to that rope, we're going to have a hard time. We need to keep that rope tight. Tight with things like doing our quiet time, spending time with God. That's what strengthens that rope. The next thing in the analogy is actually the slalom and horse. And you saw the slalom and horse on the video. The slalom and horse is a series of buoys. The first two buoys that you have to hit, you have to go through, are called your entrance gate. Then you round a series of six buoys, and you go out the exit gate, which is another two buoys. So, as a Christian, the first thing that we have to do is hit our starting gate. What is the starting gate? It's our salvation. And we ask God to come into our heart. It's he who directs us. If we hit that starting gate, we have our salvation. And the next thing, we want to go around this buoy, but we need to hit the exit gate. The exit gate for a Christian is eternal life and heaven. Now, skiers, remember you heard one with the shortest rope wins. They're competing for a prize. But in the Bible, God tells us, do you not know that in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. At skier, they may get a trophy, but that's not going to last. <coughs> Us as Christians, we run the course and we hit the exit gate. We've secured heaven. It's something that will last forever. We have a crown that will be there and be ours. <coughs> Now, those buoys that you go around, they represent your work. You heard on the video how when you're running the course, the rope gets shorter and shorter, making it harder and harder to get around those buoys. That's, again, the same thing for us as a Christian. If we're out there doing our work, sometimes we have to really stretch ourselves to reach that person. It's not always a comfortable reach. Sometimes we have to go out of our comfort zone and give our testimony in front of people as, um, in order to do God's work. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on that analogy, but I need you to understand that analogy to understand some things that are coming up. Sorry, I got a strong mouth. But, um, all right, so I want you to keep that tucked into your pocket. I was pretty much skiing through life. I had hit the entrance gate, my salvation. I was trying to serve God. There would be falls. I was not perfect. But God always turned the boat around and came and picked me up. And we kept running the course. He was always there for me, guiding me, coaching me, and teaching me. So, I'm out running the course, doing the best we can, until we hit 2005. 2005, we were living here in Seven Lakes. I had two young children. They were turned eight and ten that year. I had a wonderful husband. I was a fitness instructor, teaching about ten classes a week. I dropped down to about five classes a week so that I could be a more hands-on mom to my kids. I was PTA president. I was swim team coach assistant. Every time that we had a free moment, we were out on the lake playing or hiking or doing something. I say all that to say I was extremely active. I'll cut to the chase here and say that I started having strange symptoms. After a lot of doctor's visits and tests, I was diagnosed with muscle expressive. Now, MS, what is MS? You're, this is your next bonus lesson for the day. Muscle 
atherosclerosis is a disease that causes the body's immune system to attack the central nervous system. Central nervous system is your brain and your spine. I want you to think of all the nerves in the body being like an electrical wire. The electrical wire, the wires are on the inside, but they're coated with plastic. Now, in EMS, your body basically eats that plastic coating away from that nerve. Whenever that happens, things short circuit. Electricity doesn't run like it should. It causes neurological issues. That's one reason that a lot of you probably know people with MS. The symptoms are all over the board. It depends on what nerve that it attacks as to what symptoms you have. There are different types of MS. One type is called relapsing remitting. That's the most common. That's when the body is attacked it goes away for a little while, sometimes for years before it attacks again. I have a more rare type called primary progressive. Basically, when it attacks, it doesn't let up. There is no cure for MS. There are drugs to help slow the progression, especially for relaxing remitting. Not quite as much for primary progressive. There have been some alternative treatments that people are trying. But again, with most diseases, the quicker you get the treatment, the less progressed the disease is, the better shot you have at getting some rate up, at some positive rate. So, that's your little bonus lesson for MS for the day. So, go back to the story. 2005, I'm 35 years old. I have a wonderful husband, two young children, and I've just been diagnosed with MS. Wipe out. That's what we say in skiing. Somebody has a really hard fall. I was scared. My family was scared. We didn't know what was going to happen. But I have an incredible support system. That incredible support system, along with a lot of prayers, and all that faith that I had tucked in those pockets earlier, from all those spiritual giants that had been teaching me and guiding me, we managed to get through the diagnosis, and we forged on. Now, there would be a lot of falls in years to come, and a lot of wipeouts. Lose your ability to physically water ski? Rough water. Start using a cane? Wipeout. Lose your ability to run and play with your kids. <coughs> Rough water. Be confined to a wheelchair. Wipe out. But every single time, I can promise you, that God turned the boat around, sat there with me, <coughs> did not let the rough water go over my head, and we started again. Amen. Now, this is part of the story I want you to really hear. Earlier this year, back in February, I started having complications from MS. Basically, it landed me in the back of an ambulance in severe pain. After being pumped full of medication, after being pumped full of medication, I woke up. And when I woke up, I could move nothing from the neck down. I had gone into the hospital hard of losing use to my leg and most of the use of my left arm. But I did have my right arm in front control. But now I had nothing. Major wipeout. I was terrified. My family was terrified. Christ the prayers went out to everybody that we need. I have prayers coming from all over the world. I literally know prayers coming from four continents. My home church where I grew up, that community. Rodney's home church, that community. Churches that we had attend, organizations we've been a part of, work associates. Everybody was praying for me by 
name. Folks, I can tell you, when you have thousands of people praying for you by name, it is a completely humbling experience. I had this huge blanket of prayer wrapped around me, and I felt them. I want to stop right here and say thank you, because I know a lot of you in this room were part of that prayer team. I had this huge blanket of prayers wrapped around me, and I felt them. But I had had this breath knocked out of me. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Now, I would eventually get back to you with my right arm some and some trunk control. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is right here. I lost my focus. I took my eyes off the prize. I started making it about me and not about God and what I was supposed to be doing, going for that eternal prize. Now, at this point in time, I began to pour a breath. I pitched fits and temper tantrums and cried a lot. God, this isn't fair. If this is how it's going to be, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. I'm going to stop doing my quiet time. I'm going to stop trusting you. Because you know what? God had already spun that boat around and was sitting right there with me. He would not leave me. God, I don't want anything to do with you. This isn't fair. He said, all right, I'm sitting right here. I promised you earlier, remembering that was Isaiah, I said I wasn't going to let the rough waters overtake you. I'm right there for you. I'm big enough to take your anger and your frustration. But I'm right here. I'm not leaving. He said, remember, you're a child of God. You are blessed. Why are you sitting right there in the water, pouting? Look up. See that beautiful sunset that only I take care of? I'm here. Oh, by the way, here's a card from the spiritual giant in your path to let you know and encourage you. Oh, by the way, look around. Look at your husband. Look at your children. Look at your family. You are blessed. You are a child of God. And I'm not leaving you. All right, God. I hear you. I think you knew the best way to get to me was to keep just Throwing the blessings and showing me blessing after blessing after blessing. I said, all right, God, I'll take the rope, but I'm still not sure to take it. So, I started doing my flight times again. Now, my flight times are internet-based. It's not me going to look for any certain verse or any certain words that I'm trying to you want to take a guess at what the first few quiet times were about? They were all about how God uses circumstances for his glory. It was subversive, like, even though you are temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials, this is no accident. It happens to prove your faith which is infinitely more valuable than gold. That crown, that eternal crown, I had taken my eyes off the prize. It's more valuable than any gold. God was testing my faith. So then we followed up by other verses, <coughs> like for our present troubles are quite small, and they won't last very long. Yet for these for us is glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now, rather fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone. 
for the things that we cannot see will last forever. All right, God, I hear you. Tighten up the rope. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's easy. This is rough water. But I know that God is the one that constantly circles back around and picks me up. And he's not going to let anything happen to me. Now, today, I've got three challenges for you guys. The first one. Is, do you know my boat driver? Are you a Christian? Have you accepted God into your heart? Has there ever been a time you said, okay, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died for me. I want you in my heart. I want you to guide me. I want you to be my boat driver. I want you to direct my path. I want you to protect me. And I want you to coach me. The second challenge, if you are a Christian, are you keeping that rope tight? Are you doing things like doing your quiet time? Are you spending time with God? Or have you thrown the rope down? It's the time for you to pick the rope back up and trust God. Now, are you out there going to those buoys? Are you reaching and trying to bring other people into God? The third challenge I have for you probably is the most simple. Are you looking for your blessings? Do you need to go back and be that child and say thank you God for my mom and my daddy and build yourself back up so that you can appreciate and you realize that you are a child of God and you are blessed. I'm going to turn things back over to Pastor Chris now. But I want to say thank you for hearing my story. And I hope something I said today will bless someone. Amen. excuses why we wouldn't share our testimony with our woman. And to hear somebody who's gone through things that I can't even imagine and endured things that I can't even comprehend. And to get up here and give praises to my king. And I think there's special crowns in heaven for her. Amen. Amen. And folks, I, listen, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed this morning. I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a short invitation. Because I think that she just gave as crystal clear a gospel message as has ever been given. So what I want to do is I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the boat driver. Maybe you don't, you've never recognized that you're a sinner. Listen to me, the Bible says that all of us have sinned and we all come short of the glory of God. But God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take your place. And the only way that we can get to know him is by accepting what Jesus did as payment for our sin and receiving the our heart. And if you're here today and you haven't done that, listen, Tom, you get, did a great job presenting that this morning. And maybe you're here and you haven't done that. And God's speaking to your heart and you say, you know what, Pastor, I know that I need to trust Christ as my Savior. And if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, that's me. Could you just raise your hand so I can pray for you quickly? Right where you're at. She gave a second challenge. It wasn't just know the boat driver, but it was um, think about your circumstances. How many, how many things have we been blessed with and we get so caught up on thinking about all the negative things? You know the Bible tells us whatever things are true, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good to report, if there's any praise, think on these things. And I know I can get down and start thinking about all the negative things, but man, what a challenge that is this morning. Maybe you're here and you've been, 
you've been right there with me, that you've been thinking about negative things and focused on negative things instead of looking around at all the things that God's blessed us with. And maybe God speak to your heart this morning. You say, you know what? I just want to praise God because I want to stop thinking about all the negative things and I want to just focus on you, Lord. He says, Chris, can you pray for me this morning? That's my prayer. If that's you this morning, will you just slip up your hand? Amen. Amen. Listen, I don't know what your need is this morning, but I know this, that God is faithful. And every time I fall and every time I wipe out, as I said, he comes right back. And I hope that you leave here knowing who the boat driver is and knowing that you are blessed beyond measure. I'm going to uh, pray and we're going to stand and sing a hymn. And I'm going to pray and if you need to come forward, I want you to the altar with him. So let's stand for prayer. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for the testimony that Tanya gave this morning. Lord, the willingness to step out and share her story. Lord, that's what we've been asking everybody to do, to share their story. God, this morning, she shared her story in a way that, uh, to many people, Lord, she's not like most of us. They can go out to work and go out to the grocery store, go to different classes and different things, Lord. She has to be confined to that wheelchair. But God, she stepped up and went out of her comfort zone and shared the good news with these folks today. And I pray, God, that that will be a motivation for us to go out and be more positive in life, Lord, and, and to share the good news that you've given to us. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll have your will on this invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.